a basic Bayesian analysis, but uh, we would like to uh, introduce the gravity and magnetic method as well, since uh, this uh, method is uh, very uh, important to support the exploration uh, stages. So, but in this uh, opportunity, I just would like to introduce the basic principle and also the application for the uh, hydrocarbon exploration. So this is uh, our talk today. So actually, uh, we would like to uh, introduce the uh, fundamental uh, principle of the gravity and, mag and, magnet uh, and magnetic method. So in this uh, op uh, opportunity, I, I will not uh, solve the math for the uh, basic principle. So, and also, I would like to discuss about the application of this method, as well as the uh, how to acquire the, the data process, as well as interfacion. Uh, and the gravity and magnetic method is uh, are the uh, geophysical method which uh, using the basic principle for gravity me we measure the uh, contrast density so every time that we would like to analyze the contrast density uh, on the uh, rock yeah, the right tool for measure that a contrast density is uh, gravity. But in the other hand, if you would like to uh, measure the strength of the uh, magnetic fields, and also in our application is the anomaly, we use the uh, magnetic method. So if we don't have the variation contrast, in our uh, uh, rock, we could not uh, record the anomaly of dose of a potential uh, fill on the uh, subsurface. Yeah, we saw this. Yeah, this is the cartoon of the example how the uh, lateral uh, variation of the uh, properties rock. So, for example, if there is no uh, intrusive body here we could not uh, measure the magnetic or gravity anomaly of contrast uh, on the surface. So this is the requirement of the, uh, this method. Okay. The application of this method for the hydrocarbon exploration, uh, especially for the uh, recognitions, uh, basin sedimentary recognition, it's uh, very useful. So since the coverage of this survey can uh, cover uh, regional or sub-regional with uh, the uh, cost effective, it means uh, still affordable uh, with uh, the various of the company size. Yeah. So this, uh, Medan potential anomaly, both of a gravity and magnetic, as we can see on the uh, picture at the low right uh, corner here. This is some example of the gravity and anomaly from Wikipedia. So, as uh, we can see that uh, actually we can see some uh, subsurface map, but with this example, we only see the uh, anomaly high and anomaly low. To interpret what this means, we, we have to have the uh, ground fruit. Yeah? Later on, I will uh, uh, explain what kind of uh, ground fruit or what the kind of method that will be help us to interpret the subsurface based on this anomaly map. So for the uh, 
data, the area that have another data, as, especially we have uh, seismic uh, 2D or 3D, this gravity or magnetic method can help uh, for the structural mapping. Especially if we have problem with imaging under a soft body or uh, there is a lot of igneous rock that uh, deteriorate the seismic image, these two methods, it will be uh, helpful. Another application that uh, can help uh, geoscientists if we have problem with the uh, density log, since uh, density log is very sensitive with the uh, borehole environment, uh, this uh, gravity method can help as well. Uh, there is uh, some uh, borehole tools for measure the density cont contrast around the borehole. And lastly, uh, we can use this method for the uh, reservoir monitoring. See? Okay. So, actually, uh, the, this method is the facet method. What's mean the facet method? Facet method means uh, we measure the, the energy potential which available uh, itself. We don't introduce any uh, source of energy. So in this method, we only need the receiver. Yeah? For the data acquisition of this method, actually we have to consider about the, the purpose of the survey. Why? Because uh, related to the consideration of the of cost effectiveness. Uh, the image at the right uh, side here, yeah, it's uh, showing the two anomalies. This is the uh, magnetic anomalies with different acquisition parameters. On the left one, based on uh, 200 meter line spacing for the acquisition using 200 meters meter line spacing whereas on the right hand side uh, using a 600 meter line spacing it's quite obvious uh, this of map is uh, uh, slightly different on the left we have the more resolution if we compare to the right one here yeah, the left higher resolution than the right one. Yeah, actually, it is mean uh, the fit for purpose. If we just uh, need of the regional or large scale study, uh, sure, we just need uh, on the right one. If we compare the left one, since the 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 large feature, the large anomaly still can identify it. with the sparse uh, line spacing, uh, the, the cost of the acquisition, it will be uh, much cheaper compared than the uh, denser one. So that's why we have to consider the design of this acquisition is fit for purpose. The, the sensor of the graffiti we call is graphimeter or gradiometer. The graphimeter measure the vertical acceleration which is uh, has uh, common units in our uh, application is milligal, and the uh, modern uh, instrument has an accuracy uh, very very good is up to 0 0.01 milligal. Whereas the gradiometer uh, is the instrument for measuring the gradient of acceleration. Uh, the the, the units is different with the graphimeter. Yeah. For magnetics, uh, uh, we use the magnetometer. Magnetometer, uh, the, the units are usually in the nano Tesla. Okay. The type of the survey can be differentiated based on the instrument and, and uh, the logistical uh, support of the acquisition. So the type of survey will be land, uh, marine, and uh, iron. Aero, aero survey, yeah, airborne survey. So for uh, the this one is uh, 
depend on our requirement. If you would like, uh, we would like to have the uh, the result much much uh, higher resolution. Uh, we we used to the uh, land surface, and we, we can use the much more uh, denser line spacing. But uh, consequently, is the the cost will be much much more uh, expensive. So this is the example of graph graphimeter. Nowadays, the gravimeter is uh, very, very affordable. If you compare with the uh, early, early development of gravimeter, for the land magnetic as well, uh, the tool is uh, handheld and uh, very, very affordable. We have the GPS uh, for positioning here, and then for for the uh, receiver of the magnetic field anomaly is uh, very, very light. Uh, but for the uh, aero, airborne uh, survey, usually the magnetometer is mounted uh, on the no nose of the plane, uh, boom, uh, here, for example. Okay, uh, let's move on to the how to interpret and model, model the data of the uh, graffiti and magnetic. In magnetic and graffiti uh, interpretation, we should be uh, familiar, familiar with the method of the forward modeling and inverse, um, inverse modeling or inversion modeling. What is the forward modeling? Yeah. Uh, forward modeling actually, yeah, basically we have a model yeah, for example, we have a, a 2D model, a subsurface 2D model. In this case, the, in this example, is very simple. We have two layers model with, with different uh, contrast density, for example, uh, Sansun and, and uh, Bessman. Yeah, based on these uh, parameter models, mathematically, we compute the, the synthetic or a computed anomaly response based on our model. Actually, we, uh, we have the equation for generated the, the curve on, on the middle here. Yeah. So actually for modeling is we have uh, create model based on uh, rock properties and then uh, compute the uh, anomaly response based on the, the equation. There's a lot of equation. You can uh, select which one that uh, very uh, fit with our uh, problems. And what is inversion modeling? Yeah, basically, inversion modeling, uh, one uh, method that if we have the observed uh, anomaly here, for example, and from this observed anomaly, we would like to interpret what kind of the uh, model that created this uh, anomaly response. Yeah, For the Inversion, we need the initial model to constrain uh, the result. Why we need initial model and why we need a constraint? Since the inversion modeling uh, is the ill force of the uh, process. What is ill force? Ill force means not unique solution. Many, many, uh, many, many model can generate the same uh, response. It's Actually, a geologist said all models are wrong, but some useful. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's let's look at the uh, the image on the right, uh, top right here. This is the example of the anomaly graffiti. Actually, this uh, example from the TGS, and we we if we would like to interpret what kind of subsurface that generate this kind of anomaly. Uh, we need the modeling as we uh, discussed uh, previously earlier. So for example, if we uh, take the cross-section through the A and B line here, and if we look at the cross-section below, uh, this is the magnetic anomaly. The the thicker one, the thick line here, this is from the uh, real anomaly. In this case, it's magnetic. And the thin one line here, 
is actually the best fit of the result our um, modeling for this integration yeah as well as uh, the same as the graffiti here uh, we try to find the 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 best fit between the observed data and the calculated one uh, how we can generate this model here we, we as uh, I mentioned earlier, we need uh, some constraint. For example, if we had uh, seismic data, we can utilize it. If we had the well data, it's very, very important to put the properties on each layer. And if we don't have anything, uh, I mean, well data, seismic data, or we don't have any information about outcrop, yeah, the last, the last point that we need is we, we have to try to find analog since if we don't constrain this model we we can uh, generate a, a thousand model that can can uh, fit with the uh, observed data that's uh, that's one of the uh, drawback of the uh, our inversion uh, modeling so let's move on to the what the recent development of the graffiti and uh, magnetic methods so actually in the uh, instrumentation uh, the graffiti method uh, nowadays we we measure the median potential of graffiti with the full tensor what's mean the full tensor in in conventional we just uh, measure the vertical uh, one but with the new um, measurement we can measure the uh, horizontal uh, components as well in terms of the uh, sensor itself uh, rapid uh, development on the MAMS uh, technology micro electromechanical system yeah it's uh, it's helping on the uh, the size of the tools and also uh, the accuracy of the uh, measurement result. For example, at the image here, uh, if you can see the lower left image, there, there are two images anomaly based on the conventional one on the left, uh, far left hand, hand side. Uh, this is from the low resolution uh, conventional uh, the same area but different uh, method of uh, acquisition with using the different uh, sensor with the, as we can see here for the FTG one we we can see more detailed uh, anomaly features yeah that's a benefit of the full tensor gravity okay next move on the result some result of the case study uh, this is the magnetic uh, anomaly method uh, result from the central and south alberta and in this uh, case study example i just would like to highlight uh, beside the uh, common processing flow that have been applied to the uh, magnetic method here there is uh, some special processing in this case to highlight of the anomaly based on the uh, automatic gain control uh, and also uh, the the technique for the displaying for example on the right far hand side here we just using the um, color map uh, display without any enhancement uh, displaying technique but on the middle here uh, we represent represent the anomaly by uh, the uh, shaded relief map emphasize techniques uh, so if we see here we can see more detail of the anti amplitude anomaly yeah alignment if we compare with the left hand side if we just look at the left hand side without the uh, white lines here it's uh, it's not really easy 
to find the alignment of the anomaly. So based on uh, this result, actually, uh, this anomaly uh, are associated with uh, ductile structures. So how can we uh, associate with this uh, result? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we have to have some calibration uh, process. Yeah. After we calibrate with the hard data and uh, coincide, the, the, these anomalies is associated with the uh, ductile structure. Okay, that's uh, very, very important when we uh, interface this uh, anomaly data, both of uh, graffiti or magnetic, we should have some ground throat uh, reference. Yeah? Without the, that ground throat reference, we could not uh, relate it to our geological uh, model or uh, to geological meaning. Okay, come up to the end of the, my presentation. So there's, there are uh, two key learnings here that I would like to emphasize. Uh, graffiti and magnetic metals are essential for uh, hydrocarbon exploration, but they do not replace the seismic. Yeah, we still need the seismic. And lastly, graffiti and magnetic survey should be designed fit for purposely to resolve the specific kind of anomalies. Okay, that's all uh, what I would like to talk today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yayat. So, because the first speaker has done, so for the second speaker, Mr. Kotangi, the time is yours. Okay, so uh, the question from first session will be postponed until my presentation ended. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Kotangi. Okay. Okay, let me share my screen first, yeah. Can you all see the, the slide? Yes, you can see it. Okay. How about my voice? Is it clear? Yes, it's very clear. Test, test. Okay. Thank you very much for the moderator. And thanks for Pak Yayat to uh, open the, the discussions this afternoon. So the reasons why we start with understanding about the introduction of the graffiti and magnetic as one of the non-seismic technology that we have in the exploration effort. I think the main reason is to provide the uh, kind of a overview for all of the students here uh, that the graffiti magnetic is really a powerful tool that we can use to start up with our exploration in a regional uh, sense. So as the, the, the birds fly so high on the sky, they tend to start to see or screen the, the targets that they want to, to achieve down there in the surface of the earth from the distance. And then the graffiti and magnetic helping us to really have a look at the regional, even mega regional uh, kind of standpoints. And then the birds can fly or falcon can, can fly a little bit lower and lower and start to see some of the targets. And then it can select which targets that I uh, would like to, to see more in further detail. And then after that, then based on the graffiti and magnetic, we can design our 2D seismic data or 3D seismic data acquisition uh, better because we already understand about the, the main lineaments of the structural trends. And then that's why we would like to see the structural traps. And then we put the seismics over there and then the falcon or 
the birds and fly a little bit lower again and then start to see where is the well location. I think that's the analog to, to do the exploration effort. Start from the sky, see from the distance like what we do in the outcrops. So if you see the outcrops in the fields, you don't see directly close to the wall, but then you start to see it in the distance and then see what kind of the mega structures or the bedding planes that you see. And then after that, you walk a little bit closer and then you see, you start to see about the, the structural sediment and, and then a little bit closer, then you can see the grain size, the fabrics, etc. That's also the, the technology that we use. Graffiti magnetic is a powerful one to start with. And let me start my uh, the slide here. It's actually about the outline on, on the topic of introductions to the integrated basin analysis. So I divide these presentations into about six here. The, the first one is the most important one, the data, the data compilation. So it's about availability of the data, the quantity of the data, and then the quality of the data. The data can be, as you see there in the slides, let me uh, go to the pointer options. Mm. Oh, yeah. Okay, never mind. Can you see? Okay, this one. Lesser point. So the data can be outcrops, the previous field studies or publications, and then the graffiti magnetic that Pak Yayat just presented, the seismic data, and then wells, wireline logs, cutting, score, you name it. So once you have the data, then you have to make sure that you can access it. That's one, one more thing that I miss here. Access, accessibility of the data is also one important one because you know that the data is there, but if you cannot access it, then it's, it's, a, it's a shame, okay? And then the geohistory analysis is actually about structural tectonics or geodynamics. And I would like to uh, start with explaining about how dynamics the earth through the times and the geological scale, time scale because that will be important to understand about the paleogeography and then that will relate to the tectonostratigraphy as well when you talk about stratigraphy in the next uh, uh, point. Uh, I specifically would like to talk about the parasequence sets of stratigraphy because in an uh, exploration uh, phase, it is really, really important that we talk to the geophysicists so then they pick the right horizons and then we can start with the mega sequence first before we are dealing with the more detailed one. And then talk about the salt seal and then also reservoir, I forgot to mention as well. And then there are two things in salt seal and uh, reservoirs. The presence, if we are talking about the exploration play, and then the effectiveness, if we talk about the well target. So in the exploration play in the next uh, chapter, we have to know or uh, enough to understand uh, where is the source, seal and reservoir. No matter the reservoir is tight or not, we don't know yet. No matter the reservoir or the source is thin or not, we don't know yet because we may start with a very little data set and with poor to moderate quality data. So as long as, like what I said earlier, as long as the falcon or the bird can see something, then we actually can and can do uh, a target or, or further prioritizing the, the next steps here. So in the exploration play, we basically generate some of the hero lines and that will explain where is the source rock, where is the reservoir, where is the, 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 the cap rock and then no matter the reservoir will be thick or not that, that, that will be in the next plan while you, you do with the data and then well 
proposal, then that's really the short point, what we call as a short point target. Then we just start to understand about all of the, 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 the element of those three, source, reservoir, and seal, the thickness, the quality, and then et cetera. Yeah, so in exploration play and well proposal. Okay, so then from the beginning when you are in the non-informed status, before you have the data and then you have, you have to evaluate all of the data, then you are in the non-informed status. And then while you do some of those works using some of the data, then at the end, no matter how much or how many the data you have, you should be able to do the parameter risking assessment. And then to quantify the results, then you become informed. And you start to understand whether you need more data or you can just uh, go ahead with accessing the block or etc. something like that. Okay, so like the outlines that I showed you earlier, I would like to start with the geodynamics. This is the Wilson cycle. I think you may all know about this uh, uh, diagram. So it basically starts from here uh, when the earth is actually started with uh, one single uh, continent, what we call as a supercontinent. And then after that, the continent is kind of a rift. Um, and then the rifting, the full rifting, it can create the, the ocean, uh, oceanic plates in between the two continents that's been separated already. And then through the time when the compression is going back, influence those two continents that uh, apart each other, becoming now closer, closer each other again, then it closed the, the previous uh, oceanic plates. And then until the both continents meet each other in the event that we call as a collision zone. So this kind of a, a process actually um, repeat, repeated through the geological time. And then as an example here, the latest uh, supercontinent that we know is actually called Pangaea. And before Pangaea, according to some of the publications, there were at least six more supercontinents that have an age about uh, kind of a billion years ago. So the Pangaea, you can imagine it, the Pangaea supercontinent is the sixth generation of the supercontinent. This is in the early Permian age from Metcalf 2011. And I would like to bring you all to see a little bit um, animation about the Paleozoic uh, um, geodynamics. Start with uh, some hair here in the Gondwana part just close to the Middle East, uh, present day Middle East. If you see, this is the Pangaea, this is Africa, and this is the South America, all still together in Pangaea supercontinent. And then Antarctic, and then in Australia, is still within the southern part of the Pangaea, which is called Gondwana. And then the northern one is called Laurasia. If you have a look at my cursor here, I closely uh, flip or click my cursor here. You see that there's a T4 spreading or rifting here happenings in the Gondwana, northern part of the Gondwana, and then separate the Cimmerian kind of a trend, which is later in the tertiary time docking into the Himalayan mountains. This is in the early Permian Kungurian, and then if I click again one more time, then it is again that the Cimmerian trend or uh, microcontinent is actually get closer to the equator. If you see here, this is the zero degree of the equator. So you see that this is the, the southernmost of the of the Cimmerian is basically Sumatra, our Sumatra in Indonesia. Yeah? Even in the late Permian, the Sumatra is still within the southern hemisphere. And then later in the Mesozoic time, and start with the late Jurassic. This is again uh, the Australia and Antarctic as a part still uh, with the Gondwana uh, land. 
southern part of the Pangaea. And then if I look again in the Cretaceous time, you see that this Argolan and southwest Borneo, which is the western part of the uh, Kalimantan, is actually separate from the Gondwana as well, but a little bit different part with the Cimmerian or the Himalayan candidates there. So this is the Greater India that will also start to separate from the Gondwana, but Southwest Borneo and Sumatra is here, it's already docking in Cretaceous. And then later in late Cretaceous, you see that Greater India gets closer to the Laurasia here to the north, and Mesotet Mesotetis is already subducted under the proto Sundaland, under the Sumatra, and now becoming called as the Cenotetis. And then continue to the Middle East in time, then see that India already drifted away to the north, even um, uh, already reaching the equator here. And you see that the Cenotetis here is already um, have a subduction with the Proto Sundalan again. And you see that Australia also already start to separate from the Antarctic with this sea spot spreading over here. And then the more interesting one is actually plate reconstruction from Hall, 1997. This is again just trying to tell about the tertiary or kind of uh, um, geodynamics. You see that India here. So for your information that Hall only made this start from the 55 million years ago, which is in the early tertiary, Paleogene time. So this is the starting point. See that the India goes and then have collided with the Laurasia. And then Australia is also creeping up to the north, closer to the equator. And then see that the southern part of the Sundaland is uh, rotated here. And the South China Sea is also opening up here. And then the Pacific um, is actually pressing the, the Laurasian into the west. So this is kind of a complication kind of things in the geodynamics, but behind the complication things, then we can also get the benefit of the petroleum basins uh, in the individual type of the um, uh, uh, subductions, collisions, and etc. that you have. Okay, I hope that this uh, little bit animations and uh, from Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and the Tertiary can help you to fresh up your memory, understanding about at least the Indonesia part here, where the Sumatra is docking already in the Equator since at least Permian, and then Southwest Borneo at least in the late Cretaceous, and then later in the eastern part of Indonesia Sea, Halmahera, and then Papua is creeping up to the north and in the very late uh, time. Okay, this is the gravity anomaly of Indonesia that I took from JRDC in 2002. Um, this is actually just to see the lineament from the scale bar here, the color scale bar. The blue shows the low gravity and then the red actually shows the high gravity. And you see the lineaments from the Sumatra here going to the southern Java and then continues to the uh, Timor, Banda Ark, and then Papua and Halmahera. That actually corresponds to the subductions until the Sumba here, and then change into a, what we call as a collision between the Australia and part of the Sunderland of that. And then along the subduction zone, along this dark blue here, we, we know that there's um, uh, the trend of the Nias, similar islands as a uh, island arc. Uh, or accretional prism, uh, excuse me, the island arc is actually terminology for the the, 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 the the meeting point between the two oceanic plates. But if this is between oceanic and uh, continent, then we call as a uh, accretionary prism. So we have the mountain range, as you see in the high gravity trend here. This is the Bukit Barisan and then continue to the Java is actually the southern mountain that also consists of uh, a volcanoes and then continues to the north with the Sulawesi and then Manado and then Philippines and goes into Japan, Korea there, to the north. Yeah, so, and then this is also 
interesting that the high gravity anomaly here is actually corresponds to the Pegunungan Jayawijaya and Papua New Guinea mountains. Although in the gravity anomaly, we see the similar colors as the red being the high gravity, but the red over here is actually the mountain range that uh, resulted from the subduction process between the oceanic plate and continent plate. But this is it's a little bit kind of a different as a collision with the microcontinent of the Australia to the north and then the, the, the main Australian continent to the south. And then also again, this is subduction here until Sumba because we call subduction because it contains oceanic continent and uh, oceanic and continent plates meeting. And then this is, we call it as a, a, a collision. Okay. So then Pak Mino with his laboratory in ITB is actually try just to, to, to try to draw the lineament with, uh, with the major faults here with the red colors, as you see. Um, there's a seafloor spreading, some in the Caroline plates and then some of the collision that I mentioned earlier. And then this is again the collision, this is the subduction and some other the lineament of the smaller order faults that actually been polystructures has been influenced by the multiple or, or, or continuing kind of a geodynamics that happens in the southeastern part of Sundaland, which is our country, Indonesia. Okay, um, let's after the geodynamic and talk about the stratigraphy here. So I think the stratigraphy with the structures or tectonics, what we call it can also be uh, mentioned as uh, spectronostratigraphy. You see that this is uh, interesting from the Java Island. This is again from Pak Amino, from Pak Safi in 2006. That is basically the Western Java, the Central Java, and then the Eastern Java, uh, stratigraphic column. That if you see vertically from the, the older sections here in the early tertiary section, um, you know that it starts from the pre-rift, what we call it pre-rift, and then start with the rift sections, in, uh, starting in the um, oligocenes, which is the early scene rift, post-rift, and then following with the, uh, the, the post-rift as well in, in, the, in the Miocene to the, the late Miocene here. Um, West and Central Java is basically similar. You have uh, volcanics and still a lot of coarse clastics, uh, silicic clastic coming into the basin with some of the limestone as the limits between the the, the sin reef with the post reef. And differently in the Eastern Java that you see uh, more carbonates developed there as you know that Geographically, the East Java is actually located in the southeastern most tip or corner of the Sundaland. Then it's really the far, the furthest uh, location from the silsiclastic uh, input sediments from the Sundaland, which is from the north. But three of them is basically relate to the volcanic activity, which is the mountain range with the volcanic magmatic arc uh, developed due to the subduction process in the southern uh, Java. So this is what we call a tectonostratigraphy when we see that the, the stratigraphic column or successions in the area is especially controlled by the structures uh, or the tectonic events that are happening in the, in the basin itself. So it is also interesting that the similar stratigraphy we can see across the Sumatra towards northwest, yeah. So that's why we mainly call it as a classic Western Indonesia back up basins. Yeah. So this is kind of um, introductory just to understand about the, the, the stratigraphy and its relation with the tectonics. And the petroleum systems, a little bit about the petroleum systems in the, the back up basin, which is uh, mainly reef basins, is actually start with um, isolated kind of a fluvial system or lake or lacustrine that can provide you with uh, some um, high organic contents or what we call as a source rock uh, in the early rift uh, event. 
and then after that we call it as a early sin reef um, and then late sin reef we can start to have a, a marine encroachment coming into the basin because we open up already in a communication with the marine and then close by the post reef uh, in the in the myosin to the pliocin sections and then some of the area is actually capped with another limestone when the 12 million years when we are known as the inversion in Indonesia, uh, where the Sundaland in the north is becoming sea uh, or Karimata and Java Sea. Um, so then that's kind of what we call as a, um, and then the, the sedimentary input is now uh, com coming from the Sumatra and Java Island as well. It's not really only from the north. On Sundaland. And the diagram on the right, I took it from, not from Indonesia, it's just to try to give you an illustration that wherever you are in the globe, around the world, if you have the backup basin, then you have the classic uh, diagram like this. So I can just easily explain to you all that this is the oceanic uh, crust in Indonesia represented by the Indian Ocean. And this is the magmatic arc, all of the volcanic uh, range, mountain rains, what we call as the southern mountain of Java or Bukit Barisan mountain in Sumatra. Uh, the implication of the, the subduction uh, event, yeah. And then go internally to the uh, continent directions, we have the back arc basin. It is classics. In every part of the world, if you see the back arc basin, and then you call it as a four arc basin, magmatic arc, subduction, there's a one single set of the tectonics uh, that the Wilson cycle explained in, in the earlier. Okay, I hope that the example from the Western Indonesia can provide you the good um, understanding about the back arc basin, magmatic arc, and the four arc basin, yeah. I, I'm not going to discuss about which one is more potential as of petroleum basins because uh, I think the timing is, is for you know, running out. But I think now we move to the Eastern Indonesia part. And I would like to start with the Papua New Guinea area. If you see, uh, apologize of having very small index map, but you see that this is the big Papua. And the map over here is actually represents the southeastern tip of the Papua. This is in the Papua New Guinea. So this is the coastline. So that's why this is the offshore. And this is the fault trust belt in this part called Papuan fault trust belt. There's a lot of uh, big fields here in the Papua New Guinea. And then the, our, our uh, fault trust belts here, there's some of the also discovery, but it's not as big as what we see in the Papuan. And then this is what we call as a four-land basin. I will explain about why we call it as a four-land basin. It's different, it's not four-act basin. But if you see the cross sections later, you can see that the, 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 the shape or the features is actually nearly similar between four-act and, 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 and four-land basin. Uh, hold on, yeah, uh, stay, stay tuned. And this is the, the map, the time structure map. This resulted from the seismic interpretations. So the red actually represents the high or the shallow depth. And then the dark blue here becoming deeper depth. So this is in the offshore, all of the seismic offshore seismic data. And then over here is, is actually the, the arrows, the yellow arrows is show, showing the movement direction of the wood, 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 okay, the wood lock microplate part of the, the Pacific plate, uh, oceanic plate, that crash the uh, Papua New Guinea to the west and then resulted in kind of a aureful thrust belt. And this is actually the cross sections from south to north. So you see that this is the three different cross sections and all of them is the south to north or about, yeah? And I just would like to show or discuss this one seismic line here. So this is what we call as the Australian continent, the main called Australian continent. And then this is actually 
the 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 the, the mountain range, the fault, the trust belt that resulted from the uh, collision uh, process. Yeah, and then what we call in front of this, this is the thick young basins here, is actually the cannibalism of the what we see in the mountains eroded and transported down here as a basin, and this is what we call as a foreland basin. If you see that, we can just easily analog that if this is the oceanic plate and this is the magmatic arc, then we can easily see that this is the forak basin, right? I hope that you understand, you still remember my cross-section before. But because this is not the magmatic arc, because this is the, the on the top of mountain is actually the sedimentary rocks, which is uh, Kais limestone that has age of uh, late Miocene time. This is not magmatic, and this is also not oceanic plate. This is the continent. So that's why we call it as a foreland basin. So anything, the young basins uh, uh, that uh, form in front of the, 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 the mountain range resulted from the collision zones of the foreland basin. Okay, and there are two petroleum systems here. If in the Western Indonesia, you can see only reef system and then some sort of inversions in the late Miocene. And after that, it's just kind of another post reef or just a passive margin kind of things. But then here, there are two, at least two systems, petroleum system. This is the uh, proto kind of a reef systems in the probably Mesozoic. And then the second one is the petroleum system of the tertiary systems because the age of the fault trust belt here, especially late in the late Miocene to apply Pleistocene time. So the maturity of the what we have, if, if we have a source rock in the reef basins of the Australian, proto-Australian that's been uh, plunging down uh, below the, the mountain range here, then if the depth is enough and then resulted enough heating, then the source rock in the reef can be mature and then expel the hydrocarbons and then goes into the foreland basin as well. It's not only it's not only in the, the reef basin, but that can also go to the, uh, the foreland basins in with some sort of a conditions, yeah? But what I am trying to say is that in the Western Indonesia, we have the, the mainly kind of, or, or in a simple way, you can call it as a one petroleum system from the reef back up basin. But here you can also have reef, reef basins uh, in the continent with the four lane basin. Okay, I think, hope you can also have uh, the, the, the understanding on, on the terminology that I, I, I would like to try here, uh, explain. But uh, this is just a cartoon just to illustrate if you still confused looking at the faults and then the definition. And, but then this is actually the underwriting plate, the plate that goes down underneath the other plates. So this is the overriding plates. This is hinterland, what we call mountains, Pagunungan Jaya Wijaya or Papuan Pool Trust Belt. This is the orogenic wedge. This is the, the, the front edge of the basin here, the small one called Foreland Basin. And this is the far foreland. This is kind of the proto-Australia reef basins. I'm trying to repeat it as um, uh, enough so then the, the students can understand about the terminology because that's really important when people, if, if, you, if you attend the, the online sharing session, sometimes you cannot raise your hand and ask the questions with all of the terminology that you still don't know, then I would like to stress some of the uh, terminology a little bit um, slow here. Apologize for the senior profession, professionals or academies that will be boring, <laughs> bored to, to listen my explanations. But then now start with the stratigraphy discussions. Um, so what, what is the, 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 the role of stratigraphy here? I think the stratigraphy is really a key uh, 
the, the, the one of the mother science of the geology. As you see in the color here, the color is actually differentiates the, the depositional environment. The orange specifically represents the fluvial or non-marine actually. And then the green is a coastal plain and then shallow marine sandstone and the yellow and then gray is the shelf or marine shale or mudstones. And then light green is a condensed section. And then the, the dark brown is actually the submarine fan or little channels in the deep water environment. As you see here, yeah. So I would I will not try to explain what is the high stand system track, what is transgressive system track, because I think in the next uh, couple of seconds here, I would like just to explain in a more popular way to understand about why we understand the mega sequence. It's important to understand mega sequence. So you see in the legend here, green, yellow, gray, para sequence. So every single green, yellow, gray, green, yellow, gray, and then here, green, yellow, gray, it's all called para sequence. But if you start to see the uniform, the, the, the similarity of the para sequence, you can sum up or combine all of those para sequence into one called mega sequence. Now I would like to click my cursor. This is one mega sequence. Why? Because as you see, the yellow colors here, which is the shallow marine sandstone, this actually represents the coastline. It's basically co prograding towards the sea, yeah, towards the marine direction. It means that the supply sediment from the hinterland, from the, the land, is actually more than the accommodation space that they have. I would like to repeat that again. So why this called progradations or the terminology in suspect stratigraphy called is a high stand system track because the supply sediment from the hinterland from the left is more than the accommodation space, more than the, 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 the what is called the the bowl, the bowl, as you see, the, the glass, whatever, uh, to, to catch, yeah? So that's why the, the coastline is actually progressing up, uh, upward to, to the sea direction, marine direction. That's called one single para sequence, okay? And then the next one, I also try to draw another one para sequence, why I, call it as another one para sequence because if you see all of those have a down lap, have a top lap sometimes, and this is actually also have a down lap and top lap. But if you are lucky, then you have the well over here, then you can point out that the well is actually represents the presence of fluvial system, but why the fluvial system is actually present above the marine system. That's called the unconformity. And somehow, there's no way for the fluvial system is actually sit on top of the marine sections. Yeah? So that's why this is categorized as one other para sequence. As you see that there's another new coastline even more to the sea directions because what we call as a forced regression, regresi yang dipaksakan. It's not only about the accommodation space. There is no accommodation space anymore. The supply sediment still a lot from the hinterland, but there is no more accommodation space. That's why the coastline have to go deeper into the marine direction. That's what we call as a low stand system track. Okay, two mega sequences. And then the next one will be the transgressive um, uh, mega sequence. Why? Because as you see, again, the yellow here, the yellow here, and the yellow here is actually backstep. 
back to the inland direction, to the hinterland direction. Why? Because many things. It can be the the, the basin is actually drawn, subside, or that the there's kind of a local kind of a avulsion in the delta if it's a delta system. Then the, the active one is actually moved the other direction, so then this become um, flooded with the with the marine. Yeah, so this is another mega sequence. Yeah, mega sequence with the progradation and then mega sequence with the low stand, mega sequence is transgressive that consists of single para sequence. And then another one, the last one is actually another prograding mega sequence. And what is the importance of the mega sequence here? If I may. I would like to discuss this with the geophysicist. Then I would like to explain to him that I have the interpretations that based on some of the key seismic lines that I interpret, please pick this mega sequence for me, for the team. Because as you remember, we have the exploration phase, what we call as exploration play. The exploration play is basically is not really bothering about the, the details. What we have to know is actually, do we have the reservoirs? Do we have the source rock? Do we have the seals? So the seis the seis uh, sorry the seis the geophysicists will pick. So if this is the seismic lines, then they start to pick this uh, mega sequence here, one by one, carefully all over, all over the area. And then why it's important because. After we have the horizons, then we can calculate the thickness between this mega sequence, and we can generate the isopath map. And isopath map can help us to create the paleogeographic or paleodepositional environment map, or other people say or mention it as a gross depositional environment map or GDE map. It's all different terminology, but the same meanings. Yeah, so this is uh, this is just the proximal to distal, uh, so you can ignore because I already mentioned it a couple of times. And this is the two maps that I would like to um, uh, elaborate here. I, I start with this um, low stand mega sequence here. You see in the Oligocene map, in the North Sumatra Basin, this is the North Sumatra, and this is Malaysia and Thailand. You see that if I put my cursor here, there's a lot of the siliciclastics coming in to the basin, yeah? That indicated by the force regressions. This is this is this is just a story, yeah? But I would like to to to, to you to understand about why mega sequence is important. And then if I move to the younger section, which is the early Miocene depositional environment map. This cursor is actually located at the same location in the previous map, but now it's becoming more shelly, more mudstones there. Then that can represent the transgressive sequence in this one. So this is just the story about why it's important to understand the mega sequence and then draw all of this paleo deposition and pattern map. Why? Because later, if you want to try to look for the trap, the structural trap from the seismic map, then you have to make sure that every single anticlines or trap that you have, have the reservoir. Because not all of the anticlines, not all of the very excellent structural trap for way anticlines is when having a reservoir. Because ma many companies drill dry holes in the very very valid four ways anticline structural trap because they don't have uh, they don't have reservoirs on the anticline. So that's why you have to start with this understanding all of the petroleum system elements based on the mega sequence. Okay, hope this is enough. Uh, let's move on. Uh, this is actually the three D basin modeling, which is the compilation of every single geodynamics, the, 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 the para-sequence, mega-sequence work that you have, the paleo depositional environment maps, then at the end, you have 
depth structure maps, either from your interpretation as a geologist or from your fellows geophysicists. So you sum up all of these um, uh, structure maps into one cube and then do the restorations. Um, the first one is actually try to calibrate it with the well. If you are lucky again in the, in the, in the exploration phase, sometimes you don't have well because the wells actually drill far, far away from your blocks. But you can generate what we call as a pseudo wells with a very limited uh, kind of uh, accuracy, but you can guess. You have the uncertainties here to play around. Yeah, so put all of this uh, well control if you have, and then understanding about the thermal history or burial history. So uh, after that, then you understand when the source rock, if there's any source rock, uh, uh, mature. And then if mature, then if it expel, how big is the expel hydrocarbon is? And then where the hydrocarbons will go? This is the structure map again. This is the kitchen. So remember that the dark blue represents the deep, deeper depth. And then the red is actually represents the, the, the shallower depth. So from the, from the deep mature kitchens, then this is the hairy lines here is actually the migration of the hydrocarbon from the source rock. So you try to identify where are the structures that have more hydrocarbons from here. Yeah. So then you do the, the drainage area here before you go to the prospect ranking because the drainage area is trying to explain. So this is actually some of the thin red lines or thin uh, blue lines here, separated the, 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 the first area from prospect to another prospects. So for example, like this is probably the clearer one. Not all of the hydrocarbon from these kitchens will go to these structures or will go to these structures. So, all of the hydrocarbons from this kitchen that goes to this structure have this drainage area here. That's what we call as a drainage area for this prospect. And then this is probably the drainage area for this prospect. Yeah, the fats area or what we call as a fats area. And this one is actually also from this area here. You see that this is only one hairline. Why, why is not coming from here, Pa? Because this is another structure here. So before it goes to the, the, to the shallower structure, it should fill the deeper structure first or the front end of the traps in front of the deep mature kitchen here. So that's why if you start to drill the first well, try to test the deeper closure first, just to make sure that you have the, the, the petroleum system or migration hydrocarbon works. And then after that, by studying all of the seal capacity of this well, after you probably successfully drill the hydrocarbon columns there, you, you can understand whether the oil is actually filled to spill or filled to leak, something like that, etc. I will I will not explain uh, more about that because there is another um, a chapter to explain that. And then after that, after you get a prospect ranking on, on your area, then you start to simulate all of those in more carefully in a 2D ways. Yeah, so you start to replace this yellow as a sandstone, the, the, the gray as, a, as the source rock, for example, and then probably blue as a limestone, whatever, and then try to make the simulations and then sum up into 3D hydrocarbon migrations that involve all of the burial history and then porosity, permeability, and then loading, and then also the pressure history. Because, uh, you, uh, the pressure is actually is really important for, for, for the drilling, uh, whether it is a hydrostatic pressure or over pressure, something like that. So I think that's all of the compilation of the 3D basin modeling from the basin analysis that we start from the scratch when the falcon or bird flies from the, the distance from the high, get closer and then shallower and then go into the target well locations like you see in this uh, 3D hydrocarbon migration. So exploration step is, uh, 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 is, is what I explained there. 
So this is what we call integrated Bayesian analysis. And I just would like to close this uh, slide with explaining about the play fairway analysis segment map here. Many companies use the traffic light maps here just to indicate or to compile the risk um, of the prospect that they are going to drill. So the red is actually the area that have a higher risk. The yellow have the moderate risk and then the green is actually have a very low risk. So that's why you have to drill the yellow area there um, to be able to minimize your risk and, 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 and shortening your uncertainty. Oh yeah, I would like just to emphasize that risk, risiko, and uncertainty, ketidakpastian, is actually the two different things. If I may give you an illustration here that we, if we are talking about Will it be rain or not today? That's gonna be a risk. The risk being a rain or not, 50-50, yeah? But then, in fact, if the rain happens, then the rain have the uncertainty. Is the rain or will the rain be uh, hard or just smile? Grimis atau hujan lebat, with thunderstorm, dengan kilat petir. That's the uncertainty. Yang terpenting, risk-nya, the risk is the hujan or not, rain or not. And then uncertainty is lebat atau grimis. There's something different, yeah? Um, yeah, so this is the summary, my last slide. Basin analysis this is where the petroleum system is evaluated. You see that reservoir, source, tap rock, and etc. You name it, you probably know, or hapal, lebih dari saya. So what because the begin to begin to mulai hidrocarbon exploration. And then the second one is about the techno stratigraphy. So stratigraphy successions that controlled by the tectonics, as I mentioned earlier. The geodynamics actually creates the petroleum basin, and petroleum basin is actually controlled the stratigraphic succession within the basin. Like you 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 know now the, the dif difference between the four arc basin and the four land basin and why it's called back arc basin because it's related to the subduction and why we call it four land basin because it's related to the collisions, something like that. That will create your targets. What kind of the basins that you are going to drill? That's called exploration play. Doesn't matter whether the reservoir is gonna be thin or source rock is going to be low carbon content, that's number second or third one. The exploration play is just to directing you into the area that probably have all of those elements. And then after that, to prospecting, you deal with the trap and charge migration. Yeah, this is what we call as a short point, like where you shot, uh, um, menembak. The short point is actually just one single point, and you have to start more carefully, like what we did in the 3D basin modeling in the previous slides. So this is just the uh, summary. I would like, you know, I would, I would not to to to, uh, to discuss it again. So this is actually the the slide pack that um, I showed you today. It's basically, only involves the exploration and appraisal in the hydrocarbon fit life field life cycles. It's not related to the development productions, yeah. So, the explorations, we found the discovery from all of those exploration effort, and then the appraisal. If you start to have one successful exploration well, you cannot declare it as a success economic discovery before you do the appraisal. You can declare the exploration discovery success. Please, silakan, boleh. But being an economic discovery, tidak boleh. You have to do the appraisal first to drill more wells in the flank of the structures, just to understand whether the map that we have is actually calibrated with the wells, with the appraisal wells. And that's why we need the additional data over there, whether they're more seismic or from 2D to 3D or more wells. That's the appraisal one but we are still in the exploration stage there, okay?
I think that's all uh, end of the presentation. I hope that this is not too fast and then it's not too complicated with a lot of all of the terminologies, but I hope you do all have the questions and we can have discussions, interesting discussion before berbuka puasa. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Okay, we go to the discussion session. So, for Mr. Yayat and Mr. Kutadi, there is some question here that you can answer. It's up to both of you. Yeah, start from who that will the answer this question. And for the first question is from Arkan. Arkan, please unmute your audio and you can start to asking directly. Uh, okay, thank you for the opportunity for asking in this uh, in this meeting. I want to ask uh, why uh, there are any other geophysics method like geoelectricity, etc. But why we use magnetic and graffiti for oil and gas exploration? That's all for my question. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's a good uh, a good question here. Actually, yes, uh, a lot of uh, geophysical method that uh, Jay Shantis use for the uh, exploration both of mineral or oil exploration. Uh, actually, not uh, the most uh, popular in oil and gas, uh, graffiti and uh, magnet, mag magnetic method. Since the most uh, popular in the, uh, the uh, oil exploration is seismic. Yeah? But as mentioned here, Pak Kuntadi uh, describing the basin analysis, which is the we require a, a huge area of investigation so if we just using the uh, seismic method for this application it will be a quite uh, very very quite expensive uh, uh, cost for the acquiring the data with the graffiti and magnetic method we can acquire a huge area with the uh, a very very minimum uh, cost if we compare with the uh, seismic survey yeah uh, Arkan actually uh, another uh, geophysical method we, we use as well for example the resistivity the resistivity we use uh, within the uh, log uh, data analysis so almost all the uh, geophysical method already uh, has been used in the uh, oil and gas exploration, but within a different kind of uh, the uh, study area, study area. For example, since related to the, how the data acquire and related as well, the physical properties that we need to analyze. Yeah, for example, for the basin analysis, we need to identify the topography of basement, which is the contrast density is uh, helpful for identify which one the uh, higher basement, which why the, the lowest uh, basement. As well as Pak Kuntadi uh, mentioned about uh, the, the heat map or temperature for the uh, hydrocarbon generation. This, the geomagnetic uh, method is uh, helpful to identify where the, the uh, magmatic uh, flows uh, heavens. This is very, very useful. So uh, actually almost all uh, geophysical method has been applied in uh, oil and gas exploration. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. That's a very clear explanation. Thank you, Mr. Yayat. Okay, for the Second question, because of time, uh, let me read this. So, how to pick seismic horizon accurately on seismic section based on biostrategy JP data and sequence stratigraphy interpretation? Thank you. 
Payat would like to answer because Payat is also a geophysicist. <laughs> Please. Okay, uh, the, the second question is uh, how to pick seismic horizon accurately on seismic section based on biostrategy data and second. Okay, uh, bear in mind all the geophysical data is not related uh, directly to the uh, rock properties, could not tell about what kind of rock we need to the uh, calibration data. For example, in this in the case, we have to have the well data information. So first of all, yeah, this is the 101 Pak uh, Imam uh, topic for seismic integration. The, the most important things before starting the integration is well seismic tie. Yeah. So if the we have successfully uh, calibrate our seismic response to the information of the well data, it's it's uh, our our basic uh, basic uh, knowledge for uh, good uh, uh, seismic data integration for the peaking horizon accurately and uh, as well as we have to su support it by the good quality of the seismic yeah that's a that's another important thing good quality of seismic and we have uh, well data for uh, calibration yeah i uh, Hopefully this uh, this uh, will answer uh, your question. Ivan Zaki, uh, the answer is clear for you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, sir, for the answer. Okay, I just would like to uh, add some more. That again, please also keep bear in mind that uh, the biostratigraphy is actually came from well, yeah, well data. It's not a seismic. That's why you ask how to pick the seismic horizon accurately on the seismic sections. So you have to have well, and then do the seismic well tie, what we call the seismic well tie. That can help you to understand the, 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 the relationship between the, the wiggles in the seismic and the, the, the different or the changing of the impedance. Impedance is the kind of uh, density, the difference, uh, the, again, in the seismic data is the relative density. Yeah? You cannot see the rocks, yeah? but you can see from the softer rock to the harder rocks. But you don't know whether the softer rock is shale or limestone or coal or whatever. In the seismic sections, in the reflection data, you cannot, you cannot uh, name it. So you do the seismic well data first and then make sure that the well data have core or Side wall core, core data, but one in bore, and then make sure that the biostrat is uh, qualified. Then you start to stick on that one. But please keep bear in mind, not all of the biostratigraphic marker will correlate to the seismic event. Then I, I, I repeat it one more, one more. That not all of the biostratigraphic marker will always relate to the bright seismic event. Ya, enggak semuanya seismic marker yang jelas di seismic, tapi di biostrata juga jelas. Itu yang harus hati. So that's why some of the geophysicists or geologists when they interpret the seismic lens, they just call it as a, so for example, like the, in the biostrat, you see probably the, the, the last occurrence of uh, globigorina, whatever or the, the, the abundance, occurrence of the globigorinides, whatever, but then you see in the logs, there's, there's a, the high gamma ray, something like that. But remember, in the scale-wise, well data can talk about a very detailed fit kind of scale, but in seismic, even it depends on the, the good or not quality data of the seismic, you can see this 100 feet of uh, rocks in one seismic wiggle. Anyway, so sometimes geophysics just call it as a, oh, this is near of top globigorinides something. Near top, dekat dari topnya globigorina. But the geophysics still pick the, the, the strong one. Because otherwise, then if you start to pick the the unclear horizons, then it's going to be very difficult for you to map in the seismic. I hope you, you understand the, the explanation. Okay, thank you, sir.
Okay, for the third question from Bilo Rahman. Under the Parasokan set of strategy, is there a different level of responses between those three system track high stand, transgressive, or stand? If yes, where is the best system track location to do a well load? Thank you. Well, let's start from Mr. Yat or Mr. Kandi. Hello. Okay. Uh, Imam, are you still on the line? No, he's sleeping. Sleeping? Okay, actually, Imam is a uh, specialty on the. Okay. Uh, as Pak Kuntadi mentioned, uh, that uh, from the seismic, we need to uh, get a hard data constraint for the interpretation. Yeah? Uh, a, a para sequence set of stratigraphy. Uh, actually, from the seismic uh, section or seismic data, is. Uh, certainly limited to the some kind of a feature it's not uh, possible to answer all of the question of geology geologist equation yeah. but uh, from the seismic we can uh, identify the major major event different on the quality of itself yes we can sometimes can uh, map a uh, boundary of the system track but uh, sometimes it's very very difficult actually a combination of knowledge between uh, geologists and geophysicists but uh, at the end it uh, will generate some kind of the interpretation we have to uh, combine the the, the both of uh, knowledge uh, concept uh, knowledge as well as the uh, the fact from the data itself so it's this for me maybe Pak Kuntadi will uh, add some or Fasoni okay saya bisa nambahin okay the question number three yeah yeah is that a different veloc responses between a different veloc responses between those three system track? Actually, yes. If the question is that, but we have to uh, remind you that please consider the scale, the scale between the well the scale between the sequence of the stratigraphy. So, if you realize that what is the scale of the para sequence that we are going to find out from the well, then you can uh, imagine or you can interpret what well can do. For example, if the one sequence one set of sequence say the vertical section is uh, what is the highest uh, say 2000 meters but the west is only penetrated on that sections on the upper section only the question is if the upper section that you uh, uh, penetrate from the well is in the in the middle of the sandstone we don't know whether we are in the upper section of the paras of this uh, a set of the uh, stratigraphic section or in the middle or on the in the lower that's nah, that's that's for example that's thank you that's for example depending depending where the well is penetrated for example, in the middle of this vertical, the black vertical, uh, in the middle, the middle uh, vertical, not the right one, the middle, for example. Yeah. The well 
for example, this well penetrate the whole section. The question if the first sandstone that well penetrated compared to the second uh, sandstone that the well penetrated, if you don't have uh, the image or figure on the left and on the right, then you will be difficult whether the first uh, sensor is the uh, the first high stand system track or in the transgressive system track. That's that's the problem. Unless unless you uh, in the edge of the section, for example, uh, on the right. Uh, vertical section on the the very right vertical section. Yeah, you only have, for example, you only have the the one uh, body of sandstone, and in the upper part, say you have a shale, and the rest top is a shale, and the lower is also shale, where you you can see the on this the the lower one, the you know if you have the FMS FMI or whatever. That you can see the 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 dip of the the dip of the the uh, the rocks that penetrated by the well, then you can uh, interpret where we are approximately. Again, like Kuntadi or Pak Yayat already mentioned, please imagine or uh, remember the skill what you are doing to interpret. That's the idea. This is the four vertical section. You can imagine uh, uh, how to how to image uh, or to interpret where you are. And if we uh, where is the the next question on that one is which one is the best? Where is the question? Which one is the best well locked? Where is the best system track location to do a well logging? I don't know what you meant with this question. Well, well logging is after the well drill. So if you 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 have the well already drilled, then you interpret what lithology composition that you have from the drill cutting, then you have the idea where the well is drilled. I mean, in terms of where is the pos what is the positional uh, environment that you drill. If you know that you drill in the, uh, uh, what do you call that, this, this section is in the delta or in the south, then a probable uh, 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 sequence of stratigraphy you you will find, but again depending on uh, what size or the scale of the the sequence that the, you drill. So remember always compare the scale of the the the, the environment that you are uh, dealing with. I think maybe that helps. Uh, okay, thank you, Mister. So, if I sum up, uh, it is a matter of scale of the outcrop, and the next one is uh, about uh, the exact location of penetration of the logging. Is that right? Yep. You have to uh, interpret you. first. Yeah, you have to interpret where we are approximately the the well drill in terms of of this set of sequence, which is in the left. Of the vertical on on this this these figures, or in the second vertical, or in the third, or in the la the last the last uh, well, for example, if the the representative of the well. So you have to kind of like this is the 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 why you need to to know the 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 knowledge of the positional setting like Kuntadi before uh, interpreted where you are in terms of the positional environment. 
that's something that you need. So that's that's why uh, to have a spacious map, it's gonna be very very important. Like this, this is good example, good good uh, uh, presentation that where you are, you have to map first based on the seismic and well data, and then you know where approximately you are uh, uh, dealing with. Okay, so the, I think the, the only additional part that I would like to have is basically, can you, can you hear my voice? Yes. Yeah. So you cannot, uh, if you already drill wells, then you cannot uh, select whether you are, would like to logging this or not, and then would like only logging this. Of course, you already set up the plan to lock, to, 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 to do the logging before the, the well is drilled, right? But the well, when, the, when it is drilled, can provide you with the different results, right? You expect to have the sandstone, for example, like in here. But at the end, based on your model, this is sandstone, but then when the, drill, the, the well is drilled, then this is not the sandstone, but this is the volcanic stone, or this, the dikes or seals, for example. So you have to lock it anyway, because you want to know, to learn about the, the basins, if this is the exploration phase, yeah? You, you have to lock it, even if this is all seals, but remember that you also asked the previous the previous questions asked about the the biostratigraphy. Then it, it is really important to match uh, the biostratigraphy data with the log response as well, because not all of the wells, because the biostratigraphy analysis sometimes is expensive, mahal, and you cannot do it in every wells. So you can just start to know that whether all of the biostratigraphic markers can correspond with some certain log response, log curve, then you can just later correlate to the wells that, they don't, that, that doesn't have the best stratigraphy data, something like that. So if you already drill the well, then you have to lock because you, you paid already, something like that. So you, you, you drill it with this very expensive money, but then you don't lock, then that's not really the wise decision. So you have to lock. And this is uh, what I try to, would like to uh, uh, share my experience if some of the drillers here is very really interesting, right? there's always been an argument in the fields, in the rig, that the drillers would like to drill very, very quick and close the well. That's it. Safe. And then on cost. Biayanya pas dengan yang di planning. That's the target for the driller. But the geologists and geophysicists would like to have the optimum data that we already planned. So we have to make sure that all of the data that we already plan is acquired. Harus diambil datanya. Yang sudah di plan paling tidak harus diambil. Kecuali except if there's the geological hazard that can uh, uh, endanger your well uh, uh, stability, then you have to sacrifice your data. But um, the, 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 the option is um, losing the well or get the well, something like that. There's a lot of operation experience in, in the industry that you, you have to know that the driller and geologists already fight each other because they have different kind of uh, targets. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, this is, sorry, the, the lock that I try to draw here is basically just the simple way. This is shale, this is also gamma ray. The gamma ray and the shale is just actually just flat. And then if you have this really sandstone, then the sandstone will be flexed into the lower gamma ray and then goes up like that. It depends on the locations. Where it's in the sandstone, then it's going to be a very low gamma ray. And then in the shale, something like that. So you can start to provide the, 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 the pseudo well logging before you drill the well. If you know, if you can create the, the, the key hero lines or the, the, the seismic section like this, and then uh, draw into a uh, exploration play kind of a sections like this, then you can provide the initial well lock interpretations pre-drill, something like that. And then you can start to plan what kind of the tools, the logging tools that you would like to run in the well. Something like that. Thank you very much. 
Uh, pun tadi Pak Sony can I add something by Wah. by questioning you? No, you you have to teach me. You don't have no, 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 no. right. You don't have right I, class. I, no, <laughs> I asked I asked this to to give some kind of a way for the participant to understand the things uh, by having a uh, uh, answer from you guys. First of all, I want to ask about the Bayesian analysis and this parasequence set of stratigraphy model. The question yeah. is, the question is, in Bayesian analysis, can especially uh, Pak Kuntari has talked about the Western Indonesia and especially about the Papua area. Uh -uh. Can we see this kind of beautiful picture in the seismic? That's uh -huh. that's that's very very uh, 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 very very important question because. I'm afraid if anybody going into the real life of interpreting the things in the seismic and doing the basic analysis, they become frustrated because, well, uh, is, there, is there anything like this in the seismic that you see in the, say, in the Western Indonesia? Pak Sony has been, uh, you know, uh, experiencing a lot and Pak Yayat also has been a lot, both in Western and Eastern Indonesia. But uh, is, is this the kind of things that can we, we can see in the seismic or, or we can see uh, anything else? Yeah. Is that the question, uh, Andang? Yes, the question. Yeah. So okay. that uh, yeah. it is sure. a very important question for everybody participating. Yeah. yeah. To be honest, when I work in the Eastern Indonesia, when we call as an indo austral shelf kind of a regional study from the northwest shelf of Australia towards north to the Arafura Sea, and then go up to the north to the Bintuni Basin as well as the Salawati area, some of the seismic lines, especially the ones in, uh, in the north northwest shelf to the Barakan Koba kind of uh, uh, area, the Banda Ax over there, that actually we can we can have a liberty or uh, uh, um, uh, kita bisa punya uh, kenyamanan, yeah, comfort that some of the seismic data can show this progressing succession from the early to late Cretaceous time. So in the northwest shelf, northwest shelf of Australia, it's basically started with the rift basin in the Mesozoic and the Jurassic. But then it's capped with the post rift and then after that it's kind of a passive margin that kind of drifted away to the north, uh, goes to the uh, closer to the equator. Then when the passive margin is going on after the rift uh, uh, event stop, then it starts from uh, the, 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 this probably kind of a surf influx of sediments from the, the Australian continent is more than the, the what, what we call as accommodation space, like what I explained. Yes, we do see some of the uh, clinoforms like this, as well as internally in the Tango fields, in the Paleocene sections, uh, we can see also this. Even we see the, the downlap features like this, Pa Andang. Um, it's actually in the in the in the carbonate succession, in the eocene carbonates, eocene oligocene carbonates. So I think we can have a liberty of um, uh, uh, having a good seismic like this. But as what Paandang said, at many times it's not. <laughs> it's most most of the time, especially in the onshore. If you work in, in the onshore, uh, in Kalimantan, East Kalimantan, when I did in the FICO with Paandang last time. And then uh, in the South Sumatra yeah, onshore and then Java onshore, forget it. That's the reality because the seismic is also depending upon the, the burial uh, succession on top of the target that, that we want to, to, to mimic. So I think, uh, yeah, in Eastern Indonesia, there's plenty of seismic data like this in the passive margin along the collision for land basin or passive margin pandang. That's what, what I uh, can I also add the tectonic uh, basin, uh, the, the tectonic position of the, the section of the station, right? Yes, depends on the yeah, especially the passive margin, like uh, yeah. the, the passive margin, like in Australia, but in the reef basin, post the reef, basin, reef, basin, reef basin, back art basin, the western Indonesia, yeah. In the Western Indonesia, I think I do see it when I saw the paper from uh, Wayan when in early 90s when he published the Ngrayong sandstone equivalent of the deep marine sands towards south. 
that I can see still in the 2D, the poor 2D lines, I can still see the, the kind of forms for that. And then also in the southern Madura Kangen, in the uh, northeast Madura Basin, Pandang, where the North Lombok Basin over there. Uh, that's also some of the, the, the later seismic lines. And then MCG lines. We can see that the kind of form is actually coming from the north going down to the basin into the deeper section yes we do see okay. it in uh, some some it depends on the tectonic settings of course yes yes exactly uh Pak Yanto, can i add yes sure, sure. Yeah, but Sony. Yeah, i i agree with you Pak Yanto. for indonesia it is very difficult to find this kind of beautiful pictures like you said uh but I agree also with uh, Kuntadi. We only have only part of this, not a, a full set of uh, parasquen sets of stratigraphy here, but only like transgressive system track. Yeah, very often we we have this uh, this kind of features, but not the full set of this 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 system track. Why? Simple. The most uh, Indonesia, especially Western, is uh, filled with uh, tertiary uh, sediment. Uh, in terms of tectonics, very active, so they don't have time to have a, a big basin uh, that create this kind of uh, a beautiful set of uh, stratigraphy. Uh, and I remember when Henry Posamentrin. Henry Posamentir, the one of the the expert in this kind of uh, uh, stratigraphy, uh, when I did the 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 field trip in in US, the the US outcrop mostly is tertiary, where I also mentioned in the uh, the previous uh, talk that I gave to to uh, uh, U -U -U UGM, uh, the problem with the, the the tertiary section and also in Indonesia, uh, there is no uh, quite long time to and uh, in terms of scaling, it's, it's difficult to find this. I mean, maybe it happened, but because seismic revolution cannot uh, cover the smaller scale in the tertiary section. Uh, compared to the the skill in preterie section, if you notice that what uh, Kuntadi uh, explained is in northwest self, which is uh, most uh, section on the area is preterie. That's that's my answer. It's it's difficult unless the next or the future the resolution of seismic can cover and image the smaller. Uh, uh, a set of sequence stratigraphy like this kind of picture. That's what what I can uh, add to your question, Pak Yanto. This is uh, not Yanto, so, sorry. This so, is sorry, Andang. Before Pak Andang, Andang Batiar. Uh, <laughs> Pak Andang Batiar. Sorry, Mister. Uh, Pak Andang, Mister. <laughs> yes, Pak Andang Batiar. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Pak Andang, apa kabar? Happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sorry, Mister, uh, because many of us, I think, uh, live in Western Indonesia, so we must break the fasting. <laughs>